Welcome, everyone. Hello, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are located. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Stephanie Rao, Executive Director at the National Council on Public History. We are a membership association dedicated to helping public historians put history to work in the world through community building, programs, and scholarship. Thank you for joining us today for the fourth webinar in our six part series exploring scholarship related to the World War II home front facilitated as part of the National Park Services commissioning of an update to the 2007 theme study on the topic. If you've joined us for a prior webinar, you know that we're delving into several topics and new scholarship related to the home front. This evening, this morning, we will be hearing from Mr. Joseph Bonata from the Guam Preservation Trust for his presentation, I Hinanoa To, Our Journey, A History of the Chamorro People and World War II on the Island of Guam. A few housekeeping notes as we get started. This webinar is being recorded um, for those who cannot attend live or for anyone who wishes to be able to review the materials that we've talked about in presentations afterwards. Um, we will send those recordings out to all registrants for the series as they become available. Closed captionings have been enabled. Um, so click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you did not see them automatically. Please be sure to keep your microphone muted unless you have been called on to ask a question. And at any time, you can pop questions into the chat area of your Zoom screen, and I will note them for our Q&A with Mr. Quinata at the end of the presentation. And last, before we, we start the presentation, I want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Emily Button Cambeck from the National Park Service for some words of welcome. Emily? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, my name is Emily Button Cambic, and I am a historian with the National Park Service and the National Coordinator for the American World War II Heritage City Program. And this webinar series is one of our collaborative projects with the National Council on Public History uh, to provide more resources and scholarship on the World War II home front, both for the designated heritage cities themselves, um, as well as national parks and other historic sites and organizations working in memory and uh, preservation of World War II heritage. Um, and this is the only webinar in this series that isn't based on a chapter to the NHL theme study update. Um, and that's because we've had requests from staff within the National Park Service um, to provide opportunities to learn more about uh, Asian American Pacific Islander experiences in the Pacific during World War II. And um, also questions about, well, how is the home front relevant? How does that lens work for places that were under attack and under occupation and had a much more direct experience of the war than a lot of people um, living in the continental United States. Um, and so um, we are so glad to welcome Mr. Quinata to share stories from Guam and um, help us uh, learn more about the what the experience looked like for um, everyday people living on Guam so um, again, welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight. And um, I will turn it back to Stephanie to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. It is my excited to hear this presentation, having talked with um, Joe in the planning. Joe Quinata is currently the Chief Program Officer of the Guam Preservation Trust and served a three-year term as the chairperson for the National Trust for Historic Preservation Advisory Group and an ex-officio member of the National Trust's Board of Trustees. Mr. Quinata is a founding and board member of the Asian and Pacific Islanders Amer uh, American for Historic Preservation, APIA HIP. His career in historic preservation started over 30 years ago when he opened the office of the Guam Preservation Trust a nonprofit public corporation. Joe Quinata received the 2011 National Trust Trustees Award for Organizational Excellence for his administration of the Guam Preservation Trust, and he was cited an honorary architect from the American Institute of 
Guam and Micronesia chap. Joe grew up in the heritage village of the Umatak of Umatak Guam, where he initiated the heritage walking tour with Umatak youth as docents to the many historic sites and the coral reef youth, youth ambassadors learning and caring for the environment's ridge to reef. Joe is a volunteer mediator and board member of the mediation center Enafa Maulek. Thank you so much for joining us today and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I am, I'm excited. I'm excited because uh, this will be my first webinar and uh, I've participated in many different panels, but a webinar that is going to be archived is, is a whole different story for me. But I'm excited most importantly because I'm going to present to you um, something that is important to the people of Guam. And, and really that is uh, present to you our journey, part of our journey. Uh, so this presentation, uh, I will um, introduce you to the people of Guam, the indigenous people of Guam, the Chamorros. And then I'm going to uh, go on into giving you um, uh, getting a friend of mine and a, a good a colleague, uh, Dr. James Vernes, to talk about the power of place, about this village of Sumai. And then lastly, I will talk about the power of perspectives, and that is the stories from my parents. Um, today, the reality is that a lot of our survivors or war survivors have already gone. And what's left are the descendants. And, and our, 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 our parents have told us that story. Um, and we've recorded some of them, but everything that they've told is within our memories and our minds. And, and we share it with our kids and our kids' kids. And we hope to, um, we hope to present to you a snippet of that. Um, I will um, go on to uh, give you a video of um, a video of an orientation to the Chamorro people. Uh, and this video was produced by the Guam Museum. I hope you enjoy it.
I hope you, uh, I hope you like that introduction to the Chamorro people on Guam. And there's one thing that stands out very strong is that the people on Guam, the Chamorro people, um, the connection to land uh, is very, very powerful. And my next part in this presentation is the power of play. Um, it is a story about this village, Sumai village, and how prosperous this village was. Um, and then when World War II came about, uh, the community in that village were displaced and that village um, became the property of the military. And I will present to you a good friend of mine, uh, uh, James, Dr. James Vernis, who uh, who actually uh, did his dissertation on Sumai uh, and have gone and interviewed uh, the survivors of World War II um, that lived in Sumai. And I hope to, I hope you enjoy it. Would it be possible to turn up the audio on the video, please? Were the exact words my grandmother used to describe her ancestral lands, a village that ceased to exist for about 2,000 residents and their descendants. Sumai, the area that we call Sumai on the Erodes Peninsula was populated by people and just grew in prominence uh, during the Spanish colonial period. The Spanish called the country of establishing a Catholic mission there um, and establishing the port. This was the main port of entry for the island. As the 1800s rolled in, Sumai just became really important in the Pacific as a, a port of call for the whaling industry, whalers from all over the world, many different countries calling at Sumai, docking their ships. 20th century, Sumai becomes a very important place globally um, when the United States um, begins its presence on the island. Uh, Pan American World Airways eventually established its landing facilities and hotel, which brought in people from around the world. It also became a place for Chamorro's people living on Guam throughout the island to seek employment, wage labor, uh, job. The history of Sumai ends quite sadly, December 8th, 1941, as World War II uh, began on Guam. With the Japanese invasion of the island, Sumai took a big hit. And so Japan, like Spain, also saw the value of Sumai, and Sumai became the first target uh, during the invasion of the island. And as a result, the people who lived in Sumai, the people who called that village home, were pushed out um, of the village uh, during this wartime occupation. Sumai ceased to exist in 1944 uh, with the return of US forces to Guam to reoccupy the island. Uh, Sumai was completely destroyed. Uh, the decision by the U.S. Navy was to completely uh, flatten Sumai and establish what we know today as the Naval Station Guam. And as an afterthought, the people of Sumai became displaced from their village. Sumai's history as a physical village on the island of Guam ceased in 1944. Being from Santa Rita, having grown up uh, as part of a family from Santa Rita, Sumai has just always been part of our upbringing. Uh, my grandmothers talked about it on a daily basis. Sumai and its history, um, the important role that Sumai played for Guam, the, um, the experience of its people having been pushed out of their ancestral village, having their land taken away um, without compensation, without adequate compensation. Those elements of the Sumai history, I didn't find in history of Guam books. So that was a driving factor in my research, but it was also part of the finding that despite how important this place was, how important the experience of its people was, um, it did not, it was not a, a, a it was a feature prominently, prominently in Guam's history book. Another one of my findings was that although Sumai had disappeared physically from the maps of Guam, although Sumai was now a military base, um, Sumai was very much alive in, um, in the consciousness and the minds of the people who continue to share a connection 
Sumai for these people, um, it was a part of their identity. It was a part of the identity that they wanted their children, their grandchildren, and so forth to have, even though it was not physically there anymore. And one of the things I found was that it was very much a strong presence in the lives and the identities of everybody who we could call descendants of Sumai. Um, I would encounter 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, young people here on Guam who have never been to Sumai, never been to Sumai as it existed before it was destroyed yet. They would tell me, I am talking of Sumai. Uh, my family is from Sumai. We're very much still connected to the, this place um, and connected to other people who shared that that, that identity that was leading themselves to it. Well, you know, Back to Suma is an uh, annual event that's been hosted by several individuals that try to bring the, the people of Suma who are still alive today, bring them back to Suma with their younger generation to get them to reconnect with the place of Suma. Recently, there were efforts to revitalize the church and to build some new facilities to accommodate the growing community. And there was talk of a need to fundraise and we decided that a book that would commemorate the history of Suma, celebrate the history of Santa Rita being built by the people of Suma would be an appropriate way, way to raise funds and to continue to support uh, the church in Santa Rita as just one vehicle through which the memory of Suma could live. One of my mentors told me before, once before that we need to focus our effort on seemingly ordinary people who have extraordinary stories to tell. And I think that really captures the people of Suma and what they've been through and their legacy. For the younger generations today, I think that we need to accept our role as stewards, our obligation to protect these stories and do whatever we can to continue to tell them. Because if we do that, these stories will not die. To be a descendant of a people that faced tremendous hardship and overcame incredible odds should instill pride in those of Chamorro heritage today. It is about who we are and where we come from. We must never forget. Well, uh, that was a presentation by Dr. James Vernis uh, on the power of plays and about the village of Sumai. And my, my next presentation would be on the power of perspective. And I would like to introduce you to my parents, Sus and Rosabella Kinata. Um, they live in uh, the village of Humatak. Uh, where I grew up also. And uh, my, my dad was an educator. Uh, my mom was a, uh, a, uh, a, a housewife. Uh, she took care of the kids in the village. Uh, she's a master weaver. Uh, she is the baker of our village. Uh, she's everything. Um, and uh, I had a, an opportunity to to actually have several conversations um, about the war. Um, having a conversation with your parents about the war is is a very difficult thing, uh, only because they have to relive when they tell their stories. They have to relive um, the atrocities. They have to relive the fear. Uh, you have to remember that the Chamorro people really had had nothing to do with this war, but yet they uh, they suffered 
they suffered the most because they were here. You know, the, the, the elders would say that these people will come, then they would leave. They will come again and they leave. And they come and they leave. And it's just us left here to pick up the pieces. And what she was talking about really were, were the colonizers that come to our island um, and, and then they will go. Uh, and so uh, with, with uh, the power of perspective, I like to talk about their stories, my dad's story, as well as my mom, uh, because they have two different uh, perspectives. And, and I like to talk about the story uh, first uh, that my mom had, had actually told me. Um, uh, my mom was about uh, 19 years old uh, during the war, and, um, and she knew how to weave uh, baskets and mats and from pandanus leaves ever since she was 13 years old. And so when the Japanese came to Guam, the Japanese um, had put everybody to work. Uh, my mom was the weaver and she had told me that she wove hundreds and hundreds of mats for the Japanese soldiers. And she had a quota that she would have to produce a month. Uh, and she did. Um, and uh, and her story is quite a different story. Uh, she was she was not abused. She was not, uh, you know. She, you know, that there are a lot of uh, stories of atrocities. Uh, she did not experience that. Um, she just produced what she was told to produce, and she did her her job well. Um, and she lived through, through everything. Uh, her her whole perspective of the war really was not um, the war itself, and you know the, uh, the the bombing and all of that. Yes, yeah, she she said she she feared she was scared, uh, but but she she took whatever was given to her and she made the best out of it. Uh, she felt at the end, in retrospect, that that if the Japanese had stayed, that the people of Guam would have been more productive. As she experienced uh, uh, the Americans after the war, uh, she said the Americans actually spoiled the people and fed them all kinds of stuff, uh, uh, which she mentioned spam. Uh, and chocolates, uh, and uh, and yes, and and so so, in retrospect, she felt that the Japanese would have been much more, um, the the people would be, would have been much more productive uh, if the Japanese had stayed. Uh, but my dad had a whole different story. My dad uh, was about twenty three years old then. Uh, and um, and his whole story really was about loyalty, loyalty to the American people, the American, the United States of America. Uh, he was uh, he felt that uh, when 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 the Marines came back to Guam, he felt that that was that was a a, a real liberation to liberate them from the the uh, the Japanese and and the hard work the Japanese gave them uh, during the Japanese time he was he was um, assigned to to produce um, uh, food uh, uh, whether it be taro whether it be um, uh, vegetables that they had to they had to farm uh, fish they had to go catch so he had to produce all of that for the Japanese soldiers. And and it was hard work for him, and so when the U.S. came in, uh, he was so loyal that to the United States that he enrolled or he um, opted to participate in the scouting or should I call 
uh, being a militia man to go in and and um, hunt down the stragglers, the Japanese stragglers in the jungle uh, to take them out because the war apparently it, uh, have ended. And you still have Japanese stragglers that are still, um, they still think that, that the war is still on. And so you had uh, militia men, uh, local men who, um, who have to go in and uh, who know the jungle uh, by heart and have to go in and, and get those Japanese back out. And so I asked him, I said, have you, I, I, you know, um, I was, I was about 13 years old when we had this conversation. And so I asked him if he had ever shot a Japanese. Uh, and he looked at me and he goes, I would never shoot anybody. I said, our, our job was to take them out and to let them know that the war is over. Uh, that was our job. He said, but other people did actually shot some some Japanese in defense, and so um, and so his his story was a whole different story. He um, he he welcomed the the Americans. Um, he ended up become a great educator. Um, he um, he spoke English to his kids, and my mom spoke the Chamorro language. Um, and so we, uh, we grew up with, with two languages, um, uh, for he's an educator and he felt that, that we needed to compete in, 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 in the world globally. Um, and, uh, we are grateful for that. Um, uh, and, uh, till today, I would tell the stories. There are many different occasions that, uh, that they they had to go through the hardships that they had to go through um, because of this war, you know, um, and and uh, how they are they are also very connected to 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 the land. Uh, we there was an attempt uh, for the military to occupy some of the properties close to the village of Humatak, and my dad was adamant to protest against that uh and um and had, had sat me down and said don't don't you let anybody uh take you away from your your, your land uh this is this is your rights um and i've kept that uh to to today uh as i i fought for for many of um of our ancestral lands uh, um, by the military and, and also uh, by big corporations uh, that are coming in. And so, um, so those are the perspectives of my, my parents. Um, I continue to, to, uh, to tell that same story to my kids. They're all grown now. Uh, and, and in hopes that they, um, that they tell that same story to their kids. Um, and uh, that will conclude my presentation today. Um, uh, I have about, maybe about 20 minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, I can, I can answer. Thank you so much for that presentation. I want to remind everyone that you are welcome to put your questions into the chat um, and I will facilitate a Q&A. Um, and as folks are thinking about this, I am happy to start off with a question, um, which is, I am curious how these two different perspectives that have embodied you know, you, that your parents have that were brought to you and that you bring to your kids, how how do you balance those perspectives in your preservation work? Uh, quite interesting um, is uh, the fact that uh, after, after the war, uh, decades later, uh, the Japanese uh, citizens have come back to Guam, but not as... Uh, not as an adversary, but as tourists, 
And so we get about uh, a million Japanese tourists uh, that come every year to Guam. Uh, and, and the exit survey would ask them, why, why do they come to Guam? What, what was the number one reason they come to Guam? And, and they wanted to, to learn about the culture. They wanted to learn about the history of Guam of which uh, Japan is part of, of that history. Uh, and how do we balance that today? Uh, I, 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 uh, with, with the Guam Preservation Trust, we have, uh, uh, we have supported many of these sites, these uh, war um, sites we call, uh, there, there's a site that's called the Menengan Concentration Camp. Uh, the Guam Preservation Trust have nominated uh, the Menengan concentration camp uh, to the uh, National Historic Landmark. Um, and the commission had uh, reviewed it and had anonymous, anonymously uh, voted to include it. Uh, and so we are just awaiting the Secretary of, um, of Interior to sign off on on this, um, on on the approval uh, for the National Historic Landmark for Menengan Concentration Camp, and Menengan Concentration Camp is actually the largest concentration camp where you have about eighteen thousand Chamorros that were uh, were forced to uh, concentrate in this area where the river runs through. Uh, there were not, they, they were forced by the Japanese. Uh, uh, and uh, some people uh, have uh, really terrible experiences with, with, with that um, because they concentrated everybody there without any food. Um, but it was a concentration camp that did not have uh, barbed wires or, or, uh, or, fences they didn't have they had no facilities they had no food and so 18,000 people concentrated in that area had to go fend for their food um, and uh, and just the stories that were told but but the other side of that story also is the fact that the Japanese had moved 18,000 people away from the bombardment site, which was Hagatnya, the heavily, most heavily populated area, Hagatnya and, uh, and uh, Tamuning and that area uh, on the west side of Guam. Uh, so you have, you have two types of perspectives. Um, uh, and and uh, that is all, that story is all told uh, in, in our national uh, historic landmark application. Um, there are other massacre sites that have been um, uh, preserved. Um, and every year uh, we would go in to commemorate and to, uh, uh, again, provide the ceremonies that is needed uh, to remember the people that have been massacred by the Japanese at these sites. Um, and uh, interesting enough is the Japan consulate and the Japanese community have embraced that and have also come in to participate in these sites, uh, in, in the ceremonies. And so uh, it, it's an indication that, that there, is, there is definitely a balance uh, in preserving uh, the heritage that we, you know, uh, that we inherited. <laughs> Uh, from 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 these from these uh, events uh, and the stories that we continue to tell uh, and and how it's connected to all these places and so that's how uh, the Guam Preservation Trust have preserved areas whether it be structures that uh, were built by the Japanese during the Japanese occupation and we always we always look at it as, yes, it was built during the Japanese uh, occupation or during the U.S. occupation or even Spain. But the very people that built it really were the Chamorro people. 
so this is all this is this is all us uh, uh, and and this is something that we need to preserve and tell that story that it wasn't the Spanish nor the Americans nor nor the Japanese that built this it was the people of Guam that did whether they were forced to or not uh, ultimately it is our structure uh, and so I hope I answered that question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I'll share for folks who are not paying attention to the chat, Emily um, put in a link where you can read more about the NHL nomination for Menangan concentration camp. Yeah. So thank you, Emily, for putting that in. Um, we have a couple of questions from Tatiana Moore uh, who asks, how do current U.S. military occupations affect the people of Guam? And do you see similarities between these and the experiences of people during World War II? Um, my experience with the occupation today um, has been uh, profound uh, because one of my experiences, and that was 11 years ago, we actually had to take the Department of Defense to court because they wanted to occupy uh, uh, ancestral um, places on the east side of Guam called Pagat, Pagat Village. Uh, so the Guam Preservation Trust have taken the task to, to, uh, to make sure that we preserve and we, we protect that place. And part of it is going, uh, if, if we could not mitigate it, then we had to litigate it. And we went through litigation. Uh, because they, they were adamant that they wanted to take that, and we did. And the leaders and the community uh, came together, and uh, and the case was won. Uh, but uh, the military had to go back and um, and sort of replan their 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 strategies on how they're going to build up uh, the marine base. Uh, and they did so 10 years later, you have camp loss. Uh, that we are also have, we also have some issues uh, with, with everything from the live fire and range, uh, relocating uh, the, uh, the refuge, the wildlife refuge because of the safety zone, you know, and, and all of that. And, and just uncovering ancestral uh, human remains uh, and 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 the treatment of it. So every day we we um, we have to deal with with uh, really an an uh, an occupation that uh, that we had we did not sit on any table to discuss. Uh, um, and it, it it is it is an ongoing thing. It's never changed. Uh, from Sumai uh, to to Pagets, uh, except that we are much more smarter and wiser, um, and uh, and we work together as as uh, unified Guam. So I hope that I answer that question. Thank you. We do have time for some more questions if folks want to put those in the chat. Um, and we have a message from Alana of Thanks, who says, um, I'm excited to watch back the recording. My uncle died in the Bataan Death March. His body was sent back in 2016 as a hip, leg, and arm. I'm very interested in learning more about the culture and people of Guam, not from the American perspective. Thank you for your time. She says, I, yes, I yeah. also, I know Guam and the Philippines are not the same place. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, thank you. But I, I also like to, I also would like to, to, to say that, um, that, uh, you know, uh, we, we now, uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of challenged, uh, because you know, as as we all know, that the victor writes the story, you know, and and so that whole landscape is has changed. So the story is now being written by our people, and it's written for our people, not for anybody else. 
But if the world wants to be an audience of it, you know, then we welcome them. But everything that we do is our own perspectives, our own way of, of uh, you know, we, we live, we live, we lived it. Uh, it is our heritage. And we have all that right to write our own story. Uh, and, um, and we write it for our people. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of these coming about, a lot of uh, productions, video productions, a lot of these things that are written by, by our own people, for our people, and 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 if the world wants to be the audience, then we welcome them. And I thank Alana for saying for yeah. that. Um, that actually brings up another. Um, thing I would love to hear more about. I know we we chatted briefly before we started about, you know, the the timing of collecting these stories from the survivors and the work of the descendants to carry that on. Could you talk a little bit about that history collecting that has been done and and how the community has approached that and and where folks might be able to access some of those resources if they want to learn more? Yes, we, we do have a, a robust, um, uh, uh, I should say, you know, a uh, handful of organizations that have taken the task uh, to, you know, to document and, and to actually get our people to, to help the, the survivors tell their story in, in, in the different formats that you um that that um that you're you you can you can avail yourself to uh one one organization uh that i'm very grateful for is the the war survivor organization and uh it is it is a group of people uh most of them are writers uh and they were these writers were assigned to uh, a survivor and the survivor will tell this writer and most of the writers actually uh, they would assign them to a survivor that is within their family and so that becomes very informative that becomes much more relaxed uh, when they tell that story but the writers would would write about that would would actually transcribe and and write those stories and and you can you can purchase their books. They have, I believe, four volumes um, of stories um, that uh, that were um, that were that that are being archived today. You have, um, and and actually, we we start from from early on. Uh, the Guam Preservation Trust have uh, started a program called Guam History Day. And it is actually connected to National History Day, and so we we teach our kids um, to do some research, to interview folks, to to think critically, and present their thoughts into five different formats: uh, exhibits, documentary, um, paper, uh, performance, and and. Uh, and and in paper also, um, and they we every year we go through uh, we go through these uh, these these submittals and we they compete at at the at the island wide level and then the winners of of uh, the competition we send them with their teachers to the National History Day competition. And uh, Guam has won many um, uh, of the competitions over the years. We've been involved in this for the last 15 years. And so not only that we're documenting uh, in a professional manner with these writers, but we're also having our kids um, uh, with their skills, teaching them the skills to, to research, the skills to think crit critically, and the skills to present what their thoughts are. Uh, so the Guam Preservation started the program. That program now sits at the University of Guam. Uh, and then you have the Micronesian Area Research Center, 
uh, that uh, archives and, and provides uh, documents and photos uh, of the war and of um, people that wrote the stories. Um, then you have, uh, you have online um, guampedia.org. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, so, Sumai with Dr. James Vernis, it was a collaboration between the Guam Preservation Trust and Guampedia uh, to produce uh, the book, uh, Sumai, as well as to, uh, uh, to produce this video. Um, and, and so guampedia.org is a great, uh, a great site for the rest of the world to, to avail themselves of really just the history of Guam that were written uh, mostly by our people and have been peer reviewed. Uh, uh, do you have, uh, you have uh, really all the schools have tomorrow studies or tomorrow culture uh, that also uh, capture um, uh, and, and provide the history of Guam uh, to our to our, uh, our, 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 our school-age children, students. Um, so there are many efforts, on, and I recommend that not only that you go to YouTube, but you also go into Flickr and Vimeo, and uh, you have everything there. Now they are infiltrating into TikTok, so you can get some, some of Guam stuff in TikTok. Uh, which is really interesting also. Uh, and so, yes, we, we have an array of, of the stories in different formats. Thank you. We have another question from Alana who asks about the challenges you face with survivance with this topic. You know, there are two parts in, in the challenges, really. The first part's is that uh, when you, you know, and and uh, let's, you know, w w when you sit with a survivor, uh, you're actually asking them to relive whatever it is they experience. Uh, it is a real challenge. Uh, there are times when they will not speak. There, there are there are some families that that come to me and say, you know, uh, my my parents don't want to talk about it. You know, because it's just it hurts too much, uh, and and their siblings or their parents were killed during the war, uh, and it just hurts too much to relive it by telling it, uh, and and that is the 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 greatest challenge is that we ask our elders to relive the atrocities. We ask our elders to relive the hurt. Uh, They've, they've already healed and and what we're doing when we go in and and it's been it's been really frustrating when scholars come out uh and uh and have to open up the wounds just so that they can get their phd or just so that they can they can write something about about the war uh that is number one challenge then uh, and and also the next challenge and it's 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 a it's a natural thing that uh that they they are our our survivors have are are slowly um dying they're they're all um i mean uh in in my clan uh we have no survivors uh i i have a clan that is about three thousand in number, and we're all the same a r r we're all descendants there are no survivors left um, and so those are the two main challenges uh, I would not want to get a a survivor that is probably ninety years old to ask that person to open up that wound. I would not want to do that. I hope I'm, I ask, answer that question. Yes, thank you so much. You're getting lots of thank yous in the, in the okay. chat. Well, you're all welcome. <laughs> we probably, yes, uh, we probably have time for one more question if someone wants to um, 
put one in, but I just want to say again, a huge thank you to you for taking time out of your Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, to... I, I, I figured this is the best time because uh, I'm quite busy at work. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really, mm -hmm. really essential work. So thank you for for taking the time with us. I'm glad the the storms didn't interrupt us today. Right. Um, the power is back on and yes. And we're we're okay. Um, yeah. Well, I think that looks like it for questions. So I want to just say a huge thank you again. I want to remind folks that, um, you know, for anyone who came in late or wants to be able to review the presentation, we will share a recording out with you once that is processed. Um, and I hope that some of you might join us again next week um, for our next presentation in this series um, where we will explore disability history on the home front. Uh, that will be Thursday, September 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, there are lots of thanks for you in the in the chat. Um, and I just, once again, we appreciate your time so much. Thank you for sharing your history, your family's stories, and, you know, a, a wonderful host of resources where we can all learn more and explore more. So thank you. And you have my my email my uh, my mobile phone and my office phone. If if you have any questions or or you want to uh, you want to learn more about uh, the Guam Preservation Trust yes. and what we do, yes, wonderful. And we'll all be following the History Day projects from the Oh yes, yes, um, yes. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, wherever you are Zooming in from, and enjoy the rest of your Saturday, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you so much. These were incredible stories and really wonderful resources you shared. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye.